Welcome to Patrick Henry College. My name is Graham Walker. I'm the president of the college. It's my privilege uh, to uh, launch our proceedings today. This is the second in our final Newsmaker interview series uh, for the academic year. We've gotten used to excellent, compelling interviews from Dr. Olasky, and this week has been no exception, including a fiery discussion yesterday with Congresswoman Michelle Bachman. As always, we are indebted to Dr. Olasky uh, for bringing uh, key newsmakers to campus. You may know that he is the inaugural holder of the college's distinguished chair in journalism and public policy. Uh, he's also the editor-in-chief of World Magazine, the author of 20 books and hundreds of articles, uh, known and recognized, for instance, by former President Bush as the author of Compassionate Conservatism. Uh, we really appreciate the way he helps us intersect, sh show the intersection between our Christian faith and contemporary culture. And of course, uh, we have uh, people here with us for the interview live. Others may join us uh, after the lunch, next lunch break occurs. We also have uh, quite a number of people watching us through our live webcast. And of course, ultimately, these interviews also get written up in World Magazine. And we are joined, therefore, uh, in a virtual form by the 400,000 readers of World Magazine for all these interviews. Now, <clears throat> today, um, I'm very pleased with our guest because on my own uh, Safari browser, I always have National Review Online set as one of my key favorites, so I can pop on there, and usually near the top of the site, I always see what Ramesh Panuru is saying that day. You may know he's the senior editor of National Review, has covered national politics for 18 years. He's appeared on many news interview programs. He's written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, Time Magazine, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, many other publications. He also appeared on numerous television news programs. In 2006, he co-authored a book titled The Party of Death, The Democrats, the Media, the Courts, and the Disregard for Human Life. He's also the author of a monograph about Japanese industrial policy entitled The Mystery of Japanese Growth. He's a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, which I once was too. We should talk about AEI later. And he's a columnist for Bloomberg View. Mr. Panura grew up in Kansas City, graduated summa cum laude from Princeton's history department. So please join me in giving a warm welcome both to Dr. Orlasky and to Ramesh Panuru. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, tell us about growing up with a, with a Hindu dad and a Lutheran mom. Yes, well, uh, my, uh, my father is not a devout Hindu. He's uh, uh, the sort of Hindu who kind of... Uh, Every year, somebody will uh, come around trying to raise money to build a temple in town, and he kind of grumbles and makes himself scarce. Um, but uh, my mother was uh, very much a uh, devout, uh, church-going Lutheran. And um, you know, I think as is t frequently the case, they, they compromised by raising us nothing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, my two brothers and I have all um, become Christians in adulthood. And how did it come about that you became a Christian? Well, I, uh, I think uh, that the uh, probably fullest answer to that has uh, to do with the workings of the Holy Spirit right. and uh, are not fully known by me. But certainly there have been a lot of people who uh, were influences on me over the years. Um, Robbie George, good friend of mine, professor of mine from, from Princeton being one, and Bill Buckley and uh, Cato Byrne and many of the other uh, Catholics um, that I worked for, um, Father uh, Richard Newhouse, the late uh, Father Newhouse, um, all of those uh, people were, uh, were very influential with me. Okay. How did you become a conservative? You, through, uh, through reading. I, uh, you know, in, uh, when I first started to be interested in politics in high school, I thought of myself as a liberal, but that didn't really last very long. Um, I was reading, uh, I was one of the cool high school kids who, was, uh, who had a subscription to The Economist. Uh -huh. And... Um, yeah, your chicks really like that. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so my, my uh, views on economic issues um, were influenced by that. I now regard The Economist as a hopelessly squishy publication, but it sort of started me off in that direction. Um, I had a bunch of conservative friends who were always pushing Atlas Shrugged on me, uh -huh. and uh, eventually one of them got it for me for my birthday just to, to, to make me read it, and I think that probably delayed my rightward movement by a year. 
uh, that that type of uh, right wingery just never had any uh, uh -huh. appeal to me. Um, but uh, but I also started reading National Review, and uh, and that had a had a big big influence on my uh, my political views, uh, in particular in exposing me to arguments for social conservatism mm -hmm. um, that uh, were were not I was not exposed to in uh, public school or at uh, right. Princeton, and uh, and then I suppose eventually another part of my my religious uh, journey was. At a, at a certain point, deciding that you know not only did all these sort of conservative social principles sort of work, but uh, they were the way that God meant for us to live. Okay. So uh, you were reading National Review, and at some point did you decide, gee, I want to work at National Review? I was writing a lot. There was a conservative newspaper um, in Kansas City that mm -hmm. I, uh, I wrote. This is Richard Nadler? Ri yes, the late Rich Nadler. Right. Um, I wrote a column for that, and then... The um, name of that paper being? The Casey Jones. Casey Jones. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then great, great, yeah, great name. And then mm -hmm. at, uh, at Princeton, uh, the Princeton Sentinel, I uh -huh. became the editor of the conservative paper there. And uh, we had a speaker series, and uh, the then editor of National Review, John O'Sullivan, was part of that series, and, and he uh, uh, encouraged me to apply for an internship at National Review, so I did that the summer between my junior and senior years of college. Um, applied to a bunch of law schools in my senior year, and um, just wasn't all that excited about going to law school uh -huh. in the fall, so um, this was in 1995 when I was graduated, and uh, of course the Republicans had just taken control of the Congress for the first time in 40 years, so National Review was expanding its Washington Bureau, and I agreed to join that bureau and uh, deferred law school for two years while I covered the, the new Congress of the 1996 campaign. And the particular law school you deferred was? Uh, the University of Chicago. Okay. Yes. All right. And then I, I just ended up never going. I, uh, I, uh, when the deferment time was up, I used the threat of going to law school to extract a raise uh -huh. from uh, from O'Sullivan. Um, Probably not a very uh, large raise, given... Not, well, in percentage terms, okay. it, was, uh, it was pretty <laughs> right. substantial. So. Okay. And so, and so you've, and you've been at National Review, then, your whole professional life. Yeah, that's right. I'm, uh, I'm like the last person in the United States with so, lifetime employment. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I'm sure National Review has a very good retirement plan and so forth. But well, I've got, by now, I've got to be vested. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and, and, uh, did you did you right away gravitate to writing articles on politics in National Review? Was that your particular beat from the start? Politics and policy. Uh -huh. um, you know, they 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 sort of uh, just sort of throw threw you into the deep end of the pool pretty right. quick. You know, the uh, the first uh, day I was there in the summer of '95, uh, I was uh, you know I had to ask I had to call up uh, Dick Army, the the House Majority Leader at the time for a story I was doing about affirmative action, and I had this sort of, oh my, who am I to be calling the House Majority Leader? You know, this guy I've been reading about for several years, but I had to get over that pretty fast. And the, that was a very exciting time in 95, the Republican Revolution and so forth. Why did that revolution fail? Huh. Uh, well, you know, um, the sort of the high point of the Republican Revolution came just as I got to Washington, and then it was sort of downhill from there, so I, I like to think that correlation wasn't causation mm -hmm. uh, in that case. Well, I think that uh, a number of things happened, uh, and maybe the most important of them was there was a, well, uh, let me twofold. One, there was an attempt to try to govern the country from Capitol Hill mm -hmm. that, uh, that just wasn't gonna work. And then the other thing was that, um, there was an overestimation of the size of the constituency for a much smaller government. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of people who will tell you in a poll they want the government to spend less money uh, and to do less even, um, but when it comes down to it, if you are trying to ax a particular program like the Small Business Administration, there are always more people who benefit from that program and will vote on it than there are people who uh, dislike it and will vote on it 
um, because the benefits are concentrated and the costs are diffused. So what lessons do you derive from that that are applicable to the, to the looming questions now, such as the big bad sequester and other follow-ups? Uh, well, I think that uh, the Republican message and really the, the broader conservative coalition's message sometimes becomes overly narrowly focused on federal spending. And I think we are at one of those times uh, where I think that wanting to restrain federal spend spending and in particular to reform the entitlement programs has to be an important part of the conservative message, but there also has to be more to it. There has to be an explanation of how conservative ideas can uh, reform these dysfunctional tax and healthcare systems we have, uh, for example, in ways that make it easier for people to start jobs and businesses and families. Uh, and I'm afraid that uh, that we've been we've lost sight of that over the years. So, last week you went uh, slumming in the New York Times, writing a column in the op-ed page. Uh, tell us what that column was about. Well, I, uh, I joined the long line of conservatives who is, uh, uh, who've been urging Republicans to learn lessons uh, from Ronald Reagan. Uh, but I think that um, when people say we need to sort of return to the Reagan example, uh, when conservatives say that, they tend to just mean let's adhere rigidly to conservative principle. And, and I think the real success, the political uh, success of Reagan and the substantive success of Reagan came from applying conservative insights to the challenges of his time. So if you think back to the late 1970s and early 1980s, um, he's facing uh, stagflation, with low economic growth and high inflation, um, Soviet adventurism abroad, and a, a, a decline in national self-confidence, and, uh, and gas lines. And so for each of these challenges, there is a conservative solution. So we're going to decontrol energy prices, let supply meet demand, and we're not going to have gas lines anymore. We're going to rebuild defense, uh, cut tax rates from 70% to 50 and then eventually to 28 percent, um, we are going to tighten control of the money supply. And these things, I think, worked tremendously well. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, rather than learning from that success, uh, Republicans have too often, I think, tried to sort of slavishly mimic that success. And so in a completely different time, they think that the answer is, let's keep bringing that top tax rate down, let's keep clamping down on inflation, even though inflation uh, has been about 2% average over the last five years, lower than it's been at any, any decade since the mid-60s. Um, let's keep building up defense as though we were still up against the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, my argument is if you want to uh, have Reagan success, you've got to do the same thing he did in the sense of applying conservative insights to our challenges, which are different challenges than the ones that he faced, partly because he was successful. So, so let's take these one at a time. First on the, uh, the fiscal issues, uh, you've suggested that Republicans should not insist on a 25% or so top tax rate, but instead look for a radically expanded child tax credit. Could you go into that a little bit? Sure. Um, you know, when you bring the top tax rate down, as Reagan did, from 70% to 50%, that means you are taking the after-tax return on a dollar earned from 30 cents to 50 cents. So instead of getting 30 cents for every dollar you earn, you're getting 50 cents. So that is a 67% improvement in your incentives. And Republicans have been acting as though if you move from 20, from 35%, to, which is what we had for most of the last decade, to, uh, to 25, you're going to get the same kind of bang for the buck. And it's just not the case. I mean, I'm not going to actually do the math right now because I, I haven't had enough caffeine. Uh, but it just doesn't work out that way. Um, there are... Uh, we have not... Moving to a 25% tax rate just strikes me as politically unrealistic given the size of the deficit that we have now, which is larger in percentage terms than it was then, given the looming 
uh, entitlement problems we have and the aging of our society. And, um, uh, and then when you put it at the other side of the ledger, I think a very small uh, prospect of greater economic gains from it, it just seems to me not something that conservatives should put all of our eggs in that basket. And at the same time, one thing that has changed since the early 1980s is the tax burden on middle class families from the payroll tax has grown. Uh, and that, it seems to me, is something that we ought to address. We talk about, I mean, if you think about the 2008 presidential race, for example, the chief political, the chief difference on taxes between the Republicans and the Democrats was we wanted, the conservatives wanted to cut the corporate tax and to keep the top tax rate low. There was nothing in that for middle class people directly, whereas Reagan cut middle class tax rates and kept middle class taxpayers from being constantly kicked into higher tax brackets by inflation. Uh, and there has to be, I think, uh, a middle class component to the tax message. And it seems to me that the, the best thing that we can do for middle class taxpayers is expand the child tax credit so that middle class families um, get some relief. So a lot of students here are probably not familiar not having done big time tax form work uh, about the child tax credit, how valuable they are to their parents. Um, so how valuable are they to their parents now and how valuable do you think they should be? <laughs> well, you know, that's a trickier question than, uh, than it sounds like. Um, uh, the, the current size of the tax credit for children is $1,000 and I think it should be about $5,000. Um, but what a lot of uh, people, even pretty sophisticated tax analysts, I think, overlook is the way our entitlement system combines with our tax code to actually discourage people from having kids. Uh, and this is a kind of a subtle point, but it's one where the economic literature is, uh, is, is pretty solid. Um, if you think about it, before you had Social Security and Medicare, one of the incentives, one of the reasons people had kids was to take care of them in their old age. And that basic generational bargain is still in effect. It's just been socialized and collectivized by Social Security and Medicare. And as is often the case when you socialize something, you've changed the incentives. So right now what happens is if you don't have kids, you get the benefits of Social Security and Medicare that are made possible by the fact that other people are making the financial sacrifices necessary to raise children. And if you actually um, sort of do the math on that, I think you need something like a $5,000 tax credit in order to simply make the government neutral on the question of whether you should have more kids. Do you think a $5,000 tax credit would actually then lead parents to have more kids? Well. I think you have to think about it in terms not of bribing people to do something they don't want to do, mm -hmm. um, because there's extensive international evidence that that sort of thing doesn't work. But we are in a country where uh, what demographers call ideal family size or desired family size is larger than actual family size, okay. which suggests to me that people would have more kids if the economics of it um, was a little bit easier. And that is something that we can and I think should do. And what else should the Republican Party do to start being thought of as a party that helps the middle class as opposed to the, the stuff, well, it's only helping the rich or the big corporations and that sort of, what, what other proposals do you have? Well, Republicans, uh, I think quite rightly resisted President Obama's health care initiative and uh, have wanted its repeal, but they have not united around a robust program to replace it, uh, it that would make health insurance affordable to people. I think that you could very easily design such a program, um, but you know they have preferred to just stay uh, in opposition, and I don't think that's enough. And I think that we saw that in the election. You can't run on a platform uh, where your basic healthcare idea is to take health insurance away from people, millions and millions of people, uh, and have that be a successful platform. So that's another place um, I think that there 
could be some progress. How, I think how higher you, education. Let me just ask on healthcare. Sure. What would what would you do if you if you could uh, be the master designer of, of this of the system? What what would you like to see? Well, right now there is a tax break for health insurance uh, that um, is essentially unlimited. Um, in that the more expensive health insurance you get, the more that tax break is worth. And also, the higher up the income scale you are, the more that tax break is worth. I would flatten that out into just being a tax credit, where I think the great value of that would be if you choose a cheaper health insurance plan, uh, you pocket that saving. So there's an incentive to economize. And then the other thing I would do at the same time is, is say to people, if you don't have access to health insurance through your employer, you can use that tax credit to buy health insurance for yourself, not have to go through your employer. And so I think you essentially get to universal coverage, but in a much more affordable way, with much less government bureaucracy, much less threat of government rationing down the line. Um, you know, and there are other things that one could do. Uh, I think that you should probably put in a lot of money um, until these, this new individual health insurance market is up and running to help mm -hmm. the people who are frozen out of the existing market, people who are already sick and can't mm -hmm. get good insurance as a result of that. Um, but I, I think something like that we ought to... Uh, I, I think conservatives for many, many years thought of health care as a liberal issue yeah. and didn't devote time and energy uh, and intellect to it, and I think that has been a very damaging decision. Well, let me just ask about that. I've, I've asked a number of uh, Republican senators and members of Congress uh, why, when you did have control for a while in terms of both the White House yeah. and, and both branches of Congress briefly, uh, why didn't you do anything then? Yeah. And uh, on, on that, I, I kind of want to walk a little bit of a fine line here because I actually defend, would defend them a little bit from that, uh, from that criticism that they didn't do anything on health care. Because if you think about it, they never had 59 or 60 senators the way the Democrats had in 2009, 2010. And the little things they tried to do, a medical malpractice reform and uh, something called um, small business fairness, which would allow trade associations and unions and all kinds of groups to band together and offer health insurance, um, those things were filibustered by the Democrats. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm not sure they would have ever gotten more legislatively accomplished without having more senators, but they could still have uh, associated conservatism in the public mind with having solutions on health care and not just being people who are totally uninterested in helping people. Okay. So what else would be the major points of, of your domestic agenda? Well, I'm, you know, I'm not running for anything. I'm like, I, I guess, your guest uh, the other day. Right. Uh, I, I, had to enjoy, I enjoyed the description of the fiery discussion with Congresswoman Bachman. I'm not sure there are any other kind. <laughs> um, uh, the, uh, I think that higher education is a place where there are a lot, there's a lot of potential for reform in terms of encouraging online learning, simplifying the financial aid forms, um, requiring uh, colleges to um, publish uh, the starting salaries and the five year out salaries of their graduates based on their majors, uh, for example. Uh, I think that there are a lot of places that uh, conservatives sh can, uh, uh, can make a real difference that liberals will not be willing to do because your most university administrations in this country are, uh, are an important part of the liberal coalition. So um, publishing the starting salaries and five-year out salaries, mm -hmm. uh, think that would have a big influence on students as far as choosing majors and so forth? Yeah. I, I think it might help, uh, particularly as their parents help guide them in uh, making some of these decisions. All right. Um, turn to foreign policy for a minute. Uh, uh, is there, uh, in, the, in the Reagan coalition, of course, there was a strong uh, sense of containing the Soviet Union and, and eventually rolling it back, as, as did happen historically. In what ways is Islamism now and the way we should act towards it similar to what ways is different from the way we did act towards, right. the, towards international communism? 
Well, I mean, I suppose that the, the great differences um, are, uh, they are they are not in a way as much of an ideological threat, right? I mean, there 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 are not large numbers of people in the West, uh, for example, to whom Islamism um, and Sharia law and so forth are are great uh, attractors. Um, they are not as much of a threat uh, in that they uh, they don't have anything like the nuclear arsenal that the Soviet Union did, and. Um, they are uh, a little trickier, more hydra-headed, uh, more diffuse because um, so many of them are, are non-state actors and all of those things have required a, a difference in the way um, that we, tr that we uh, respond. It, it, it requires a different blend of law enforcement and military force, for example. It has been a very tricky set of issues um, to handle legally. And we see this sort of unsatisfactory and still unresolved um, uh, situation and sort of the law of the war on terror right now. Hmm. Yeah, let's turn to social issues. Uh, is, the, is the fight against same-sex marriage uh, a lost cause at this point? And if so, is it one of the lost causes that are worth fighting for regardless? Or what would you suggest? I would like to be able to deny that it is a lost cause. Uh, I do not see a lot of evidence um, that leads me to think that it is a potentially winning cause. Um, I, you know, I, that doesn't change my view about the duty of public officials to to stand for what's right, uh, as the best that they can they can uh, figure that out. Um, I think that, uh, but let me let me. Also, though, make note a distinction that I think people too often overlook. To say that it is a, a lost cause or a cause where everything's sort of headed south doesn't mean, I think, that it is one of the main problems that conservatism has right now. Because if you think about the four states that voted on uh, the marriage question in this last election, in, in each of which the uh, uh, cause of same-sex marriage won, the opposition to same-sex marriage was stronger than the Republican ticket in each of those four states, um, which suggests to me that it's not an issue that is dragging the party down. And even, you know, even if you look at something like uh, the California initiative in 2008 uh, against same-sex marriage, which carried California and everybody made the point, well, young voters um, were two to one in favor of same-sex marriage, they were even more strongly for Obama oh. over uh, McCain. Uh, so again, whatever problems the Republican Party has, um, it strikes me that that is not at the forefront of those issues. Um, I, I don't, uh, all that said, I don't know what the way forward is on this um, issue, but I do think that um, uh, it is wrong in principle to, uh, uh, to redefine marriage, um, to be about something other than uniting uh, a man and a woman in a way that is oriented towards the, the, the weirding of children. Um, and I think it's particularly wrong to rewrite the Constitution as though that is uh, a mandatory policy. The New York Times today has a front page story about a uh, to be filed uh, Supreme Court brief from Republicans mm -hmm. uh, saying that same-sex marriage should be the law of the land. And some of them are folks who supported laws, you know, who supported the California Initiative, for example, and now they're turning around and saying, oh, by the way, this law that I supported, voted for, I now not only think it's a bad idea, I think the Supreme Court should strike it down as unconstitutional. I mean, yeah. that strikes me as, a, as, as taking the Constitution and the rule of law pretty cavalierly. We'll turn to questions from you all in just a couple of minutes, but, uh, but let me ask, ask one more on, uh, uh, well, on abortion. Yeah. Uh, you had uh, in your book one of the great titles, The Party of Death. Uh, is there any life in the party of death concerning abortion? And if so, uh, well, and then secondly, uh, are the Republicans still the party of life, and do you think they'll continue being so? Oh, I think that uh, the Republicans have been more and more uniformly a pro-life party. Uh, I mean, think about um, the just completed um, 
uh, the, the presidential primaries of 2011, 2012. The most liberal person in that uh, primary field, John Huntsman, was pro-life. Right. Uh, it's not like 2008 when you had Rudy Giuliani, whom some people were taking seriously as a candidate on the other side. There is no, I mean, if you, when I started covering national politics in the mid-1990s, you had uh, pretty important governors, California, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Republican governors who were all pro-choice. There are still some pro-choice Republicans here and there. Um, you know, people like Brian Sandoval in Nevada, which is about as obscure as I have to get to come up with one of these people. Mm -hmm. And even they don't define themselves in terms of their stance on this issue. That is, they are not invested in changing the party's position on this issue. The party is not particularly vocal, does not lead with this issue, never really has. Mm. Uh, and partly that's because as the party's gotten more uniformly pro-life, there are fewer pro-life Democrats to pick off by making this an issue. Um, but I think uh, I, I am not worried about you know, who wins the, the party nomination in 2016 mm -hmm. on this issue. Um, I do think that, I think pro-lifers have, have uh, three challenges, and I'm going to try not to not have a Rick Perry moment and forget the third one uh, by the time I get to it. Um, the first one is pro-lifers have, have to find a way to make an effective coalition. White pro-lifers have to find a way to make an effective coalition with non-white pro-lifers. Uh, and that, if that happens, I think pro-lifers are going to be very hard to beat. Uh, but I think it's going to be very hard to make progress if that doesn't happen. Second, we've got to find a way to put the focus on the ways in which the pro-choice side is out of step with the, am, fo the ambivalent folks in the middle mm -hmm. and not the ways we are out of step with them. Um, and so, for example, look, as a matter of an ideal legal code, uh, I do not believe that abortion should be permitted in the cases of rape and incest. But, you know, we do have this other 98% of our over a million abortions every year that um, if, you know, we would have to restrict before we ever got around to that. So maybe we shouldn't talk as much about those 2%, and we should talk a little bit more about, for example, the fact that the President of the United States believes that it should be permissible to deliver a live infant and then kill it. Um, and then third, I would say the there's a problem with pro-life, it's a conservative coalition problem, and it gets back to what we were talking about earlier. The conservative economic platform uh, is not one that the American public has ever trusted to advance middle class interests. And as long as pro-lifers are tied to the conservative coalition, and I think we are, that is a serious problem. Uh, and, and it is a problem for pro-lifers that the conservative economic message is so unattractive to so many people. Any possibility of the Democrats uh, ceasing to be the party of death? You know, I really have a hard time seeing that. We saw a little bit of movement in that direction. After the 2004 election, uh, a lot of Democrats really had a sort of wake-up call and thought that their extremism on the abortion issue was really hurting them, and they, they recruited pro-life Democrats to run in states and in districts where they thought it would make a difference. Um, but... I think that a lot of those pro-life Democrats, they had the potential to play a real role in the party um, and making it really open to pro-lifers, and instead they all kind of folded in the name yeah. of party unity. And I think you really saw that um, with Bart Stupak um, accepting this sort of meaningless executive order on the health care legislation. Um, instead of holding out for an actual amendment to that yeah. law that would preclude any kind of direct or indirect abortion funding. Yeah. Questions? Thanks so much for coming out and talking to us today. I really appreciate it. My name is Cody Holt. I'm a senior journalism major here. I love National Review. Um, 
My question is, it's kind of a, a big, big picture question, but I'd just love to hear your, your thoughts on it. Um, after the, the most previous presidential election, um, it's been almost painful to watch the implosion of the conservative movement as the establishment conservatives attack the Tea Party conservatives and vice versa, so blaming each other for losing the election. Even, you know, even some, some shots fired at National Review for um, allegedly supporting Mitt Romney in the primary and, and pushing him to the front. What do you think went wrong in 2012? And moving forward, how do we fix that? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I think the first thing to understand is it's a party-wide problem. It's not a factional problem. Um, so, for example, um, people look at the uh, Senate losses in Indiana and Missouri, the Todd Aiken and Richard Murdoch, uh, races and say, well, the problem was the social conservatives or the Tea Partiers or the conservative wing of the party more generally. And there's a problem there. Um, those races could have been won and should and would have under different circumstances if Murdoch had said something different, if Todd Aiken had had, you know, a more better judgment and a higher IQ. Um, but Tommy Thompson lost in Wisconsin, and George Allen in Virginia, and Josh Mandel in Ohio, and on and on and on. These are all very establishment-oriented candidates. Um, so I, my answer to, and, 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 and unfortunately, a lot of my friends who think of themselves more as Tea Partiers, they will cite those examples and say, see, the problem is the establishment. <laughs> and no, it's a, I think there is a party-wide problem, and I think that problem you know, there are, there are a lot of sub-problems, but I think the fundamental one is that uh, the Republican Party is not seen as a, as, it is seen as only advancing the interests of big business and the rich. Um, and there is a tendency on the part of Republicans to think in terms of these demographic categories of, well, we're not doing well with young people. We're not doing well with single women. We're not doing well with Hispanics. And all of those things are true, and there may be some issues specific to each group that need addressing. Maybe there's something we should be doing differently as conservatives on immigration, or at least in the way we talk about it. Fine, but another issue that needs to be considered is each of those groups is more economically insecure than the national average, more likely to be looking for a job, more likely to lack health insurance. That is true of single women, that is true of Hispanics, um, uh, that is true of young people. And uh, I think when we slice and dice things demographically, people forget that overall economic problem. The, the number I always look at in the exit polls is um, the one where they ask, which candidate do you think cares about people like you? And uh, to, in 2008, for example, um, it was something like, 60% of the electorate uh, that thought McCain didn't care about people like them. <laughs> uh, and you had very similar, they asked the question slightly differently in, this, in the 2012 set of exit polls. But, but again, Obama handily beat Romney on it. And, and that is, you know, I think there was, well, let me cite the actual number. There, was a, um, there were two questions, and one of them was, which of these attributes matters most to you in choosing a president? One was sort of leadership, vision, character, and Romney beat Obama on all those things. Cares about people like you. If I remember correctly, 20% of the electorate said that was what was most important to him, and uh, Obama won that by 81 to 18. Um, now, I think the Democratic candidate is likely to win that question because, frankly, if you are the type of person who thinks that is the most important thing in a president of the United States, you're probably more likely to be a liberal because it's actually kind of a stupid thing to make your number one criterion. But 81 to 18 is more than it ought to be. Um, the Republican Party has alienated young people. And I'd like for you to elaborate on that a little bit. What do you think um, needs to change among this youngest generation of voters in order for them to lean more ideologically conservative? And what do you think the Republican Party needs to do to reach them? Well, I have a slightly different take on that than a, than a, than a lot of other folks. Um, Alan Abramowitz, who's a political scientist at Emory University and a very partisan Democrat, argues that if you trace the uh, 
proportion of 18 to 29 year olds who are voting Republican in presidential election, and watch that drop over the decades, that is 100 or nearly 100% explained by the declining proportion of 18 to 29 year olds who are married white Christians. Uh, and it suggests to me that the problem isn't so much an age per se problem, the problem is that Republicans aren't doing as well, particularly among non-whites. There just isn't, I think, a, a long-term demographic uh, solution for Republicans and conservatives that does not involve uh, breaking out of uh, the white suburbs and exurbs. Um, and, and so I guess I would, my, I have a strong inclination to think of the age issue as a race issue. Now some of that stuff, you know, changes. I mean, partly it's the age of marriage has been creeping up and up and up. And, uh, but it's still the case that married people um, are likely to, uh, are more likely to vote with conservatives. And, um, and uh, a lot of those single folks are going to eventually get married and have kids and have mortgages. My, my friend of the, uh, the pollster, uh, conservative pollster, Kellyanne Conway, I think she calls it the four M's, mortgages, mutual funds, uh, munchkins, and marriage make people into conservative voters. Um, and those things will happen. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's not, I think, a given that uh, black and Hispanic and increasingly Asian voters are going to uh, eventually become uh, conservatives and Republicans because of some sort of life event. While we have a moment, let me ask a question. Why is it that winners of the National Spelling Bee are almost always either homeschoolers or kids of Indian ancestry? You know, they're mo are, are they ever homeschooled Indian kids? That's that, right. uh, they, they, I think, I think if, if one of those shows up, everyone else just gives up automatically. So. I, don't, I don't know, but obviously there's some sort of, um, there's some kind of genetic determinism that is, that is popular because my seven-year-old was telling me the other day that um, she thinks she's good at the spelling quizzes uh, because she's half Indian. So I, I haven't told her that, but... Uh, Somehow that's, that's reached her. Um, you've said a couple times that the economic message of the GOP does not appeal to much of the middle class, and I agree. How do we make it appealable, if that's a word, um, without pandering to the lowest common denominator and becoming more like the Democrats? Um, mm -hmm. And who's out there in the Republican Party that can do that? Yeah. Great question. Well, you know, I, I myself have been looking for policy ideas that don't just ape uh, liberal prescriptions, but are really based on conservative insights. If you think about the child tax credit, for example, this enters American law because of the Gingrich Congress. It's part of the contract with America. It's the tax centerpiece of the uh, contract with America. It's then expanded by George W. Bush. Um, who runs on it in 2000, wins, and then with the new Congress, he does that, along with the marriage penalty. Um, so, I mean, I think that there are ideas that we just, we need to recover. I think that um, we can't simply contract out economic policy to the Wall Street Journal editorial page and the Club for Growth, um, who always hated this stuff back in the Gingrich days. For example, they all, you know, I, I'm not going to name names, but a very prominent supply cider, um, when uh, the child credit was first being discussed, uh, was, you know, we don't have children, but we love to ski. Why can't I get a tax credit for that? And I was like, okay, so, so children are a hobby? That's the, that's the way, you know, and a certain kind of doctrinaire economist views them exactly that way, that they're a kind of uh, a consumption good. Uh, not an investment in the future, if, even if, if we wanted to use just economic terms. And we've got to overcome that. We've got to have a pro-family economic policy, I think, in addition to a, uh, a pro-family social policy. So that, I think, is the beginning. And, and you've had, 
glimmers of interest. I, I'm actually mildly encouraged by the fact that really within weeks of the election, Governor Bobby Jindal of Louisiana uh, made remarks to this effect. Marco Rubio made remarks to this effect. Paul Ryan uh, did as well. I mean, one, partly there's a rhetorical issue here. How many times, well, you probably being normal or relatively normal people compared to me weren't listening to every speech at the Republican convention in Tampa last year, but how many times did they talk about small business owners? You know, it was all about the heroic entrepreneur who's being stifled by taxes and regulation. And the relatively free market party has to make that story an important part of its message. But most people aren't entrepreneurs. Most of us don't see ourselves as job creators. We see ourselves as job holders or job seekers. And we've got to have uh, a conservative message that appeals to those folks as well. You just mentioned uh, uh, Jindal and Rubio and Ryan, three potential contenders for 2016 for the presidential nomination. Uh, National Review, at least my impression was, was pretty much for Mitt Romney back in 2008 and 2012, I mean, in the primary season and so forth. Uh, is there a preference uh, developing a consensus <laughs> among National Review for 2016? Uh, National Review endorsed Romney in 2008 during the primaries. Um, I endorsed Romney in uh, uh, December of 2011 for the primaries. Um, uh, I had wanted Palenti earlier, but he didn't make it. Uh, he didn't make. He didn't last that long. Um, I don't think that there is a preference um, right now, and it, I don't myself have a preference. Uh, I mean, I guess if, if you held a gun to my head, I'd say Bobby Jindal, although it's going to be it's going to be very difficult for me because there's only so much room in people's minds for one, for a, you know, Catholic Indian American conservative. Um, at least, at least now that D'Souza is not Catholic anymore, we got rid of him. Um, but, uh, I think, I think he's, uh, he's very good. Um, I like, uh, Rubio, uh, and Ryan. I like what they stand for. I like them both personally. I tend to favor governors for uh, the Republican nomination. I think if you look at the historical track record of governors, um, it's a lot better than the record of legislators and actually winning the office. And I think, you know, there's a plausible theory that people, you know, just they want people with executive experience in that, in that position. Which is why we have Obama rather than Romney in the White House now. Well, but if you, uh, well, you know, he's a sitting president. Yes. Uh, but, but in a way, it's, um, he's up against another senator, right? Yeah. That's the, you yeah. know, just like 1960, a senator can win if he's up against another senator. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you ask? Uh, maybe you could talk about immigration? Yeah. I've, I've got glib answers about everything, but immigration is one I have thought and thought about for years, and I've sort of gone back and forth on some of the underlying policy issues. Um, and I've never figured out a way to make it work politically. I guess then, therefore, I will just revert to, uh, uh, well, let, let me first make a policy point and then a, then a political point. I think the most important thing um, that we ought to keep in mind uh, in terms of immigration policy is assimilation. Uh, we want to have a flow of immigrants that is compatible with assimilation. That is to say, compatible with the newcomers being able to participate fully in American life, seeing themselves as, and being seen by others as having common interests with uh, native-born people, um, belonging to the same social, political, national community. Uh, and I think that suggests uh, a number of things, because I, I think we often think of assimilation just in terms of um, economics, but I think we should also think of it in terms of language. We have to be able to communicate with one another to be a community. Um, I think that uh, it probably suggests we need a more diverse immigrant flow, uh, possibly a smaller one, uh, one that is, not in, that is not as disproportionately based on a country that we share a long border with. Um, at the same time, 
and one of the reason I want one of the reason I tend to think that we were you know for, for at least many years there it's changed recently but it was, we were running about one and a half million immigrants legal plus illegal every year and I thought it would probably be easier to assimilate if you cut that down to something like a million and one of the reasons I have favored that idea is, is the idea that the people that you do let in will be able to succeed better. Um, for example, a lot of folks who are getting low-wage jobs won't be facing quite as much competition at the low end of the wage scale and, uh, and will be able to get ahead faster. Um, so I would say I'm a, I'm a kind of moderate restrictionist when it comes to immigration. But there are a lot of ways in which I think the restrictionist side of the debate goes wrong. And one of the things I think that it's important for restrictionists uh, to acknowledge is that it's very understandable for people to come to this country illegally. It's one thing to disapprove of it, uh, to want the law enforced, um, but I think that, uh, that a message of sort of just, just personal opposition to illegal immigrants that doesn't acknowledge that people are basically doing this to make a better life for themselves and their families, which is a basically laudable impulse, um, is something that's, that's, I think, wrong and, and not persuasive uh, to people who are in the middle. Um, so at the, you know, that's, that falls very far short of a sort of comprehensive answer to the question of what conservatives or Republicans should do on immigration, but I think it's an important um, beginning of it. And I, I guess let me just follow that up with one thing I would say to the, to the more pro-immigration side of the conservative debate a lot of them have this idea that we're going to have this guest worker program. We're going to invite all these people here to work, but they're never going to be voting. They're never going to be long-time residents, full citizens of this country. Uh, and I think that that is not a great idea on the substance, and it's not a great idea on the politics to say, essentially for Republicans who think of themselves as being great about Hispanic outreach, we want brown people to come here and do work for us at, but we don't want you to have full political rights. I don't think that's a particularly helpful message for uh, the Republican Party either. Can you hear me? How about closing the border? How about closing the border? And yeah, don't you think we should close the border with with Mexico? Well, it depends on what you mean by that. If by closing the border you mean no, having zero net immigration, I, I, I don't think that's no, that I makes don't sense. Mean no, not that. You mean build a fence? Control the borders. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm in favor of that. Uh, um, but I would also say uh, folks who are very concerned about illegal immigration need to understand that about 50% of our illegal immigrants came here legally and overstayed their visas. So if you control the border and you don't have work site enforcement and verification, uh, you haven't solved the illegal immigration problem. Have I ex totally exhausted everybody yet? Or? Well, let me ask a question. The, um, the only Republican candidate for president to win in the last six, election, six elections ran on a campaign of the slogan of compassionate conservatism. Uh, the, the meaning of that changed somewhat yeah. during, the, during the, uh, the Bush administration. But uh, uh, number one, is the, is the brand itself now dead? Uh, number two, is the idea still a good idea, or was it ever a good idea, but uh, I think it was, but uh, is, it, is it still a relevant idea politically, the idea of having mediating structures and emphasizing civil society so that it's not just a yeah. choice between big government and the lone individual? Uh, well, people meant different things yes. by compassion and conservatism, yes. and in the form you've just described it, I think that it is absolutely uh, important um, it's, it's crucial, actually. And one of the mistakes I think Republicans made in the last election, when you think about the uh, Health and Human Services mandate on almost every employer in this country to provide coverage for sterilization, contraception, and abortion drugs, is we didn't make the case at that level that this really amounts to the government trying to remake these institutions of civil society in its image, not being willing to just tolerate the flourishing of different organizations 
that have different ideas of the good life, um, but which fulfill very important social functions that the government cannot supplant. Um, so absolutely, I, I think that is important. I thought Paul Ryan uh, made that point rather well in his own post-election speech. Um, I, I think that uh, the tricky element here is that there does need to be, I think, some kind of separation between the Republicans and the George W. Bush administration, some mm -hmm. sense that we're doing something new. I always thought Romney should have said something like, look, we've got these challenges that have been built up over the years um, and that nobody has really addressed and I'm going to address them. Um, things like entitlements, the healthcare system, the tax system, and I'm, I'm a reformer. Um, and instead they decided to run this campaign which is sort of premised on the idea that everything in American life was going swimmingly until January of 2009, um, which is you know, sort of nutty. I mean, everybody, voters know that isn't the case. Um, but anyway, compassion, I mean, the problem with compassionate conservatism as a slogan is, you know, George W. Bush's presidency yeah. is seen by the public as a failed presidency, and that's just a problem that has to be overcome. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that the Republican Party still wants a military the size of the one that was used to oppose the Soviet Union. What size, of, what size and type of military, however, do you think the Republican Party should support, particularly in an age of globalization where maintaining the security of the international system does matter, even if it's not a military designed to oppose another power? Yeah. Well, I'm very far from being a, uh, a defense expert, um, but I would just say it's implausible to me uh, that we can't find some savings there. I mean, I don't mind the idea that the U.S. military spends more than the next 10 largest militaries in the world combined, but doesn't need to spend so much more than the next 10 combined. Um, and, you know, I, I see people like Jim Talent, who I think is, was a terrific senator, uh, and is an all-around great guy, and he's arguing that we need to have a goal that, you know, we spend 4% of uh, gr gross domestic product on the military. Uh, why? why? I mean, do our military needs change when, you know, we add another $100 billion to GDP? Do they grow smaller when we have a recession? I mean, this doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I guess uh, uh, that's not... Um, an answer to the question, I would just say that there are some instincts that conservatives have that, uh, that seem to me to deserve some uh, scrutiny. Um, and I, I would lean in the direction of saying um, there have got to be ways to, uh, to, to downsize. Now, I mean, in fairness, though, I should say, I mean, I think the counter argument that gets made uh, which probably has something to it, which is that if you're going to cut the mil military spending, the path of least resistance politically is going to be to cut the most important parts, the parts that involve uh, end strength, that the next generation of weapons and so forth, because things like the kind of the welfare state element of the Pentagon is has just got such a huge constituency that you, you never end up cutting that. And I agree that that's a problem, but that doesn't strike me as a reason not to tackle that problem. I think you can see why you should probably join me in putting National Review Online on your favorites bar and checking Ramesh Ponuru every day. Uh, I should remind you, too, that if you come back tomorrow at uh, 1240, Marvin Olasky will be interviewing Dave Swavely, a noted author. And the following day at 1220, I think that's Thursday, uh, you'll be interviewing national columnist Cal Thomas. And that should be a lot of fun. But for now, please join me in thanking Marvin Olasky and Ramesh Ponuru. Cal's going to be way more fun. You can get him to do a song and dance routine.